Um, I'm Alisa. I'm a nonverbal communication trainer. I work with um, senior executives, corporate uh, CEOs, uh, private clients, and entrepreneurs on how to improve their interpersonal skills. And I don't do that by focusing on their verbal communication. I do it by focusing on their nonverbal attributes, their facial expressions, body language, body posture, hand gesture, social and business etiquette, um, everything that communicates who they are and what they're about. Simply because I strongly believe that you can't get people to give you what you want unless they like you or if they're impressed by you. But first of all, let me start by saying welcome to Bangkok. I hope you've been enjoying yourself. I hope you find the forum useful. And thank you for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'd like to show you a few pictures. And have, I have a few questions for you before we really start the session. I have been asked by Kim that this uh, should be a very light and interactive session. So I promise you there'll be no stress and there'll be no tears. OK? <laughs> right. So I'll just briefly introduce myself. I'm a Thai, born in Munich, Germany. I've lived in several countries, as you know. Uh, you know. And um, <laughs> my background is actually in headhunting. And because of headhunting, because of you know, finding jobs for people, interviewing people, and all that, I realized that a lot of people needed grooming. I realized that. I realized a lot of people needed grooming. A, a lot of people needed coaching on what to do when they go for job interviews, what to wear, what to say, how to sit, how to express themselves, especially non-verbally. And that's why I started Image Matters. I started the company nine years ago. The first three years, I started with um, grooming. So basically, I taught senior executives how to, how to dress. Um, I taught them social and business etiquette. But then I, my plan was, after three years, I was going to go into nonverbal communications, because I think that's very important. That's the least studied um, sector. And so I think it is important. And, and you know, after this session, I hope you know, that I have managed to convince you that. Okay, so um, I have a PhD in psychology. But most of my studies are based on movement studies. I don't know how many people here have even heard of movement studies. Anyone? You have? You nodded. You must have. <laughs> so you have just now, just because I mentioned it. No. Oh, so have you done movement studies? I have not heard them. Right. OK. I I see. Anybody is a dancer? Any dancers here in this room? So you do know. Ah. Ah, I see. OK. <laughs> so you do know Laban? Laban movement? Laban movement analysis? Ah, yes. OK, good. Do you? No. OK. Anyways, um, I studied, uh, I do a lot of movement studies, especially after my PhD. So I've spent another four years doing movement studies. And because of that, I had to get into dancing to understand what to tell people, how to tell people, uh, how to connect with themselves so that they can connect with other people. So that's what I do. It sounds a little strange, but yeah, um, and it works. Um, OK, I want to show you some pictures of Tawan. Tawan is, is a name, and direct translation means sun, S-U-N, sun. I often refer to her as sunrise. I'll show you the first picture. How old do you think Tawan is? It's a bad one because you know I, I use I do everything on my Mac and now I'm using a different computer so the resolution is different. How old do you think this girl is? Twenty? You said? Did you say twenty? Okay. So who say? Uh, how many? How many people think she's like twenty, twenty-two? Uh huh. Okay. Older than that? Anybody think she's older than that? Okay. I'll give you another another one of her. That's a bad one too. The, I'm sorry. I mean, when I worked on my laptop, it was perfect. What do you think she does for a living? Sorry? Go to school? Really? She looks that young? Uh-huh. OK. So who thinks she's still going to school? OK. Who thinks she's working in an office? OK. I often refer to her as Sunrise. This is how I met her. A month ago, um, actually, 
for the past five years, I've been conducting all of my private classes at Marriott uh, uh, Sukhumit 57. And um, one day I drove in to the parking lot, and there was this girl giving me you know, parking tickets. And I thought, wow, this girl is very pretty. And not only that, she's so young. Why is she here? So I, when I went upstairs, I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, why was she there? And then I, I you know, every day I go, I, I get the ticket from her, and then I think twice I gave her some money. And then she disappeared. So I asked the Marriott where she was, and I asked if they could get me her number. So they gave me her number. I phoned her, and I asked if she could come meet with me. So she did. She came and meet me, and I offered her a job. She's standing right there. Oh. Now you know why I had to bring her, Kim. <laughs> yeah, she's standing right there. She's my sunrise. Yes, that's what I call her. But what's more important is, what did I see in her? She's 19. She works from 7, to, to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. as a you know, security guard, whatever you call it. Every day, Monday to Saturday. Sunday is the only day she's off, so she goes to school. Basically, she works to support herself through school. She's from up country. So when I talked to her, I said, I don't really need any help, but um, you know, you can come work for me. So I took her to a central department store, the big, one of the biggest department stores, and bought her clothes and told her, I'm going to bring her here so you can see what it's like to really have what you call presence. That's what I do. I teach people how to focus or how to improve their presence so that they can, you know, so that they can improve themselves, so, so that they can interact with people better, so that they can, you know, to improve their self-presentation. Like I said, I firmly believe that you can't get people to help you or do anything for you if they don't like you if they're not impressed by you. I was very impressed by her. And she's super bright, hardworking and everything. I couldn't imagine leaving her in that parking lot. I couldn't. And apparently when I, when I phoned, I found out she was moved to another, another parking lot. So I said, no more parking lots, come work for me. So there she is. Yep, I'm gonna show you a video now because this is a video about first impression. What makes a good first impression? So this is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to talk about first impression. We're going to talk about presence and why it's so important for all of us to have presence and what presence really is, okay? Now, this is probably one of the first few videos done. Do you know Phil Zimbardo? Yes. Okay, so he's done this research. This is very interesting because what he's done is um, there's a headhunter in the room. She'll be interviewing three ladies for a PA job. And so we will go through each one, you know, we will see how she interviews them and how she reacts to them and everything. And we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll pause as we go through them and then I'll ask you what you think, okay? But it's easy to understand anyway, so. Sir, what happens when we put real people in a field experiment? We're interested in things like cooperation and competition. We're interested in group dynamics, how leaders emerge, how rules can come to control people. It's a big day for these three women. They're competing for a secretarial job starting Monday morning, and we've been allowed in to film their interviews. They've got 15 minutes each to prove their worth, or have they? We're about to find out how long it really takes to make a lasting impression. The candidates will be facing Judy Fisher, a recruitment consultant with 30 years experience. We've given her this dial, which is connected to our control room hidden away in an adjoining office. There, we're effectively going to read Judy's mind. This machine will make a trace of her thought processes. If Judy's impressed, she'll turn her dial up. That will produce a trace high on the screen. If she's underwhelmed, she'll turn it down and the trace will sink. Everything will be scrutinized by occupational psychologist Terry Kellard. Bridget. Hi. Hello, I'm Judy Fisher. Thanks for coming along. 
being prepared to do this. We're going to talk, first of all, Bridget, a little bit about what you've done mm -hmm. and about what you're looking for. Then I'm going to tell you a bit more about the job and we can take it from there. Great. See the graph? All she said was, uh-huh. Why do you think Judy likes her? Uh, she came in smiling, confident mm -hmm. and acknowledging and listening. How did she acknowledge her? By a verbal noise, so just okay. mm -hmm, and eye contact. Okay, yes, thank you, yes? Because it good. shows you're confident in yourself yes. and you're open uh -huh. and listening. Do you, know, do you know how eye contact started? No? Okay, I'll show you a video later. But anybody on this side want to answer my question? Yes, yes. Yes, you. <laughs> I think she looks quite well presented. Uh huh. Just how she's dressed. Uh huh. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Hi. I also think the way she walked in and the way she's sitting is a mixture of being confident but not aggressive or too powerful uh -huh. because she's closing herself in slightly. Okay, so very she's good. she's not trying to demand power from the situation. That's very good. So she walked in, the way she walked in made her look confident. How did she do that? What did she do with her walk, the way she walked? How did she walk? Yes? She walked up straight and with purpose. Yes. So that's the key word for today, uprightness. We'll talk about that later. Okay? So, I mean... Look at her graph. Let's see if it goes up when she speaks. OK. Yeah. Bridget's been sitting down for just 12 seconds and said all of five words. But her trace has immediately gone up from an average reading of zero to an impressive 56. Let's just start with, I've um, got your CV here. Clearly she's got School. a positive impression. That's School. the most important School. bit of the interview. Mainly. That would have been based on what she looks like. She looks like a PA. Yeah, I, just, I like that and I'm good at that and I'm yeah. efficient and fast and I do yeah. as much of making sure everything's in order as possible. The trace remains like high right till the end, finishing at nearly 100. Bridget's prospects look good. Well, you seem very focused, I'm sure you will. You've done really well. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. That's great. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So what did she do as she was speaking that made Judy like her even more? It shows that we're enthusiastic. Uh-huh. What else does it do? Yes? Um, it also communicates a lot um, about our personalities since a lot of our visual interpretation informs what they say. Mm-hmm. OK, say. very good. Why do we use... Yep. It also shows that she's passionate mm -hmm. about what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do we use our hands? Why also... Yes? It's to emphasise key points in Yes, as she was saying, she's very in order and all that. OK, so, yes. I just want to offer another opinion because sure. uh, having spent some time in China and I've discovered they don't really like uh, using hands when, when they speak. And they, at least, uh, you know, just want to bring some cross-cultural talking uh -huh. because in China, I think they may believe it's impolite to uh, to speak with hands moving around. It's impolite to speak with hands. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, so, so same situation uh, happening in other culture can can have a different consequence. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I totally agree with you because I I I sort of grew up here for a little bit. And going to school here, interestingly, kids are told, and you would understand this, kids are told not to point and not to move around too much. And that stops you from learning anything. So learning becomes, you know, one way. You just listen to me. I'll tell you what to learn, what to remember. You know, where, you know, you're supposed to point, you're supposed to move around to be able to take it all in. So, you know, learning in, in certain countries are direct, but learning should be indirect. Indirect mean you have to look around, look for information, and learning doesn't always have to be in a formal environment. It can be informal. You can learn from anywhere, as you are doing now. You know what I mean? Okay, what else did she do? Yes, I'm sorry, yes. I think it shows um, a visual side, because some people need both audio and visual to that's be able true. to fully put yes. it together and make a full picture. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's interesting because when I teach people about presentation skills, I always say, you know, nowadays in school they divide kids who are visual 
and kids who are audio. And so when you do a presentation, at, at least what I do, is I make sure I have both. Meaning I have my audio, uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> visual, to show people who are visual, who needs to look at graphs and pictures and videos and all that to be able to understand what I'm talking about. I have my body movement. I move around a lot when I talk to people, when I teach people. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very clear. I use a lot of audio in my presentation. So I think we need to take that into consideration that you can't just use the old style you know, of presentation anymore. You have to cater for everyone. Were you going to say something? No, you were smiling. Oh, OK. I thought you have another, another example. Right. Anybody else? Yes. Hi. Yes, you. Yep. Hi. I really loved that she shook hands with the interviewer. I remember the first time somebody did this in an interview with me, and I just felt that she was making more of an effort to lean over to mm. the panel. Mm. And it, I felt in our discussions afterwards, we thought, wow, she's willing to come over to our side. She was willing to touch. And that meant a lot to, to make that physical connection. That uh, is true. In the yes, yes. Yes, no, that's, I think she's, she's perfect. But let's have a look, there are two, uh, oh yes, yes, sorry. I think her tone was really good and she mm. didn't um and ah about what she was saying. She mm -hmm. was also speaking at a, a pace that I think proved her, co her confidence in herself but wasn't so fast that it was distracting. That's true, yeah, I think she was very good. Yes, hi. hi. <laughs> I just want to say, um, I thought she was very warm and she smiled. And that's the kind of quality you want in a receptionist, someone mm -hmm. who makes the person coming in feel comfortable. Yep, that's true. Anybody else? Yes. Hi. Um, speaking as someone who's Thai, when... Oh, uh, you're a Thai, are you? Yeah, okay. I am. That's why I was laughing at the uh, whole education thing. Because uh -huh. um, I spent two years in a, in a Thai, Thai school. Um, anyways, so we were talking about tone. It, <laughs> so I get criticized for this a lot um, because I'm multicultural, but in Thailand, to make a good impression on people, it's necessary to speak in two different voices, a mm -hmm. hard voice and a soft voice. Mm -hmm. And if you speak in a hard voice, they think you're aggressive. Yes. Yeah. And some places like that and some places don't. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally understand what you're saying. Right. Let's have a look. Let's just have a look at two other candidates and see how they do. Sorry, I'm not good at this. When anybody meets anybody anywhere for the first time, in order to process information, it is absolutely essential uh, to make a judgment about this person. So essentially what people do is make up their mind about a person and what that person's like, generally within the first 15 seconds. Lucy, hello, hello. I'm Judy Fisher. Thanks so much for coming along to see me. We're going to just talk a little bit about... Lucy looks fine, so her trace starts slightly above average but only just, and it doesn't last. Uh, it was my favourite song. What do you think of Lucy? Small and quick to the The interior. way she hide her hands, yes. that's interesting. Maybe she's not deliberately hiding her hands, but that's really interesting. Right, yes. Um, I think it made her look like she wasn't prepared for the questions, mm -hmm. um, even though it was a basic question. Because she's not asked. spontaneous? Uh, she took quite a deep pause before answering the question mm -hmm. um, and then sighed. Um, it sort of indicated that she didn't have an answer and was conflicted about what to right. say. Right, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a short story. I had a client who came to my class and apparently she's from the um, Human Resources and she told me that they were looking for this position for about a year and then they just hired someone and that person probably stayed for about a month and left. So I said, what happened? And she said, what happened was they had three candidates. Yeah, just like that. They had three candidates. This person was the best. I said, how? Well, she's left. She said she was very spontaneous. She was very quick in answering all the questions. And then I said, OK, so what are you going to do now, now that she's left? She said, well, the second one wasn't bad. I said, why didn't you take the second one in the first place? Because she hesitated or she sort of took a while before she'd offer any answers. So is that a crime? Because we're not all spontaneous, are we? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. 
Um, when I'm in interview, sometimes I take a pause as well because, I don't know, in my opinion, I think it would be better for me to give a structured answer rather mm -hmm. than waffle an answer that's not as impressive. Mm -hmm. A structured answer, what does that mean? So making sure I answer their question effectively. Uh-huh, okay, so you don't really pay attention to the interaction? I try to, but they do, I don't know, like, in an interv some interviews I've been, they say, don't worry about taking a pause or needing to think about something, because if they ask you about your experience, I feel like I need to take a pause to think about how I can apply that to that certain position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I understand, yes, sorry, yep. I think it was not so much the pause itself, but how she came back into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because of that sigh, instead of her connecting it with a, well, yes, or a, I have, like, because she didn't start a sentence, she just sighed. Mm -hmm. That is what shifted the emotion, uh -huh. because that showed, I think, a lack of respect at the right. core of it. Okay, interesting. Yes? Um, I think more than anything, it was eye contact. There was no eye contact? No eye contact. Or, okay, there was yeah. no eye contact. Yes, hi. Uh, I don't know if anyone pointed out, but um, she didn't smile as much. She didn't smile as much. Okay. What about what she's wearing? It's all just one colour. It's all like, just one no colour. There's no contrast in it, and okay. I think contrast is very important. Uh-huh, contrast is very important, yes. It adds to your personality, I feel. It does, it does. And isn't she a bit sort of like all covered up? in a way, you know what I mean? Her hair and everything. Okay, anybody else wants to say anything? Any comments, any other comments? Right, so let's see how she speaks. Maybe Judy will like her more. Let's go. Listen to her voice, it's beginning to lack expression. She's licking her lips, signs of tension. Long term, something. At best, the trace is mediocre. At worst, it drops interested in alternative health and nutrition and uh, one day I'd like to make my career out of that. In what? Doing what? On what side of it? Well, um, possibly working from, working from home and perhaps in a clinic as well as an uh, alternative health therapist and advisor. Lucy's lifestyle ambitions don't impress. Her traits... I think that also creates a barrier between her and the interviewer. So, since she pointed that out, give me a second. Since, since she pointed out the fact that she didn't use any hand gesture, so there's another purpose of why we should use our hands. Can you tell me why? Um, I was, because it breaks down the barrier. It, it, like, makes the space closer between you and the person that you're talking to. So it sort of creates um, an environment where the two of you are are in the it same. connects you yeah. with whoever you're talking to, right? You're extending something to them. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I personally thought she shouldn't be mentioning that she wants to work from home if she's here for a job. It doesn't show commitment towards mm -hmm. her profession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Her protection of sound is uh, quite poor and it sounds like she is not uh, affirming what she said and is not confident enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think she's u she's using only one tone and yeah. she's not very variating with it. Mm -hmm. So it shows that she's bored, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna say oh, you're going to say the same thing. Yes. Answering her questions, which I think breaks the connection. Yeah. If you've formed one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me let me let me ask you one question before I, I I take some more comments from you. What do you think a good conversation is? What is a good conversation? Well, um, people tell each other things because they want to be listened to. Yeah. So a good conversation is acknowledging that you're being listened to mm -hmm. and that the, um, you're getting res uh, facial feedback from uh -huh. the individual is, um, means that you're acknowledging right. um, that okay. you're, what their experience, whatever they're telling okay. you. Okay, so how do you acknowledge what is being said to you by someone? You nod? Uh, it can be verbal and non-verbal cues, so small sounds, and then also when you're given a chance to speak, repeating something back to mm -hmm. confirm that you've understood. Mm -hmm. Without that, you're not having a conversation. You're just wasting your breath. Do you know what I mean? So without that, like if I'm standing here and you guys are not asking any questions, I'd be out the door in three seconds. 
Okay, so somebody, yes, hi. Hi, I just wanted to say like the combination of her, uh, like the monotone voice and not using any gestures, I was really bored <laughs> just listening to it. I was sort of just waiting it, for it to be over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to me, she just looks so low intensity, if you understand that word. Yes. Um, I found her, when she did change from her monotonous tone, um, her inflections were quite harsh mm -hmm. um, and also her tone itself was quite high pitched. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's her voice, but um, yeah, the inflections were quite uncomfortable. I found. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? She was asked about her ultimate career ambitions, which is a great opportunity to demonstrate how the role you're applying exactly. for is actually going to be yep. beneficial to you. And she sounded not only very vague, which suggests that she doesn't actually have any, but she also sounded incredibly dispassionate, mm. which mm. is not appealing. That's true. Okay, yes. When you're explaining something about your past experience, it brings your past experience into a reality when you are experiencing with your gestures and postures, like with your hands. So it makes the other person to get interested in what you did mm -hmm. earlier. And it interests them to be, oh, this is great, yeah. what you did. So. So, so tell me, according to you, how do you show enthusiasm? With your gestures and posture, with your hands, the way you talk, with your eye contact. Very good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You were going to say something. Just in addition off to what he said, um, smiles too. Exactly. <laughs> smiles, smiling definitely shows that yeah, you're enthusiastic helps. about a yep. topic. Uh, I think she lacked energy, not like with the gestures and smiling. Um, no one wants an employee who just sits there and doesn't put in That's the effort. True. So yeah. energy is an important part. Mm. Yeah. Yes. And That's she's true just too. To, like, yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. Maybe she's an introvert. Maybe she's good. She must be good at something. She's just not, you know, she's not what you expect to see as a PA but she must be good at something. And maybe a different type of boss who's looking for someone different may appreciate her, right? Like the story I was telling you, so I hadn't finished. What I was gonna say was, so that lady said she was gonna go back to the second candidate whom she thought was slow. And then I said, yeah, and what are you gonna do? She said, I'm gonna tell her that we're going to take her on. I said, will you tell her about the first candidate who joined and left? She said, no. I said, oh, okay, that's great. Let's start a relationship with a lie. And then she said, well, you know, I don't know what to tell her. I said, tell her the truth. Somebody has sat in that seat before. If she comes, she'll know. And then I said, but what have you learned from this? And she said, people are different. and You can't really expect everyone to be spontaneous, which is true. You know, pausing to think is not a crime. Being quick could be judgmental, could be making decisions without really thinking things through. Right? So people are different. You just have to take them as they are. But, you know, not everyone is perfect for, you know, the particular job, but they could be perfect for something else. Okay? Now let's see the third candidate. An obvious mistake. But how quickly and dramatically will they affect her trace? Valeria, hello. I'm Hi. Judy Fisher. Good to meet you. Thanks Hi. for coming in. In three seconds, it's plummeted to a feeble minus 50. Neither Lucy nor Bridget ever sank that glow. Just going to talk a little... So, um, shopping bags. Is that really why Judy didn't like her? Seriously? Yes? I think it was more to do with the way that she came in and turned her back to put the shopping Very bags good. down. Very good. Very good. Somebody around here was going to say something? Yes. Well, similar to her ideas, uh, she doesn't really go in as a in interviewee or as a candidate. She kind of like using this spice as for her own self <laughs> to, to put her home back down and uh -huh. facing okay. back. Okay, yeah. okay, yes? Um, I'm not sure if she did read the interview but Very good. She did yes. That's what it's about. I think, I think she was saying the same thing. Yes, somebody was going to say, yes, hi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. Do you know we're all territorials? Yeah, we are. Imagine this. She walks in. She had shopping bags in her, uh, her left hand. Yeah. She opens the door with her right hand. She turns around and puts the bag down. So she was showing her butt to Judy. She didn't get a chance to say hello. She didn't even look at her. She didn't acknowledge her. She didn't smile. 
She was just preoccupied with her shopping bags, right, or getting rid of her shopping bags. So, you know, I mean, that's number one rule. When you go into somebody's house, you, you say hello to them. So that's exactly what she didn't do. I'm sorry, yes? Yeah, she also didn't ask for permission if she should drop the bag. Exactly. Or she should take the bag. Well, I don't think she should have even taken them in. You know, she could have even left them outside. You know, I, I do this, I did this all the time when I was interviewing people, when my staff used to call them and ask them to go and meet with, you know, our clients for interviews. And we say, if you're early, if you're half an hour early, go for a walk. Do you know what I mean? Go for a walk before turning up at, at the client's offices because it's just too early. If you're 15 minutes early, it means you're well prepared. If you're 30 minutes early, it's, it's a bit too keen. So just go for a walk, go sit in the loo, whatever, you know? You know what I mean? Because it does, you know, I, I mean, and, and we get a lot of um, candidates who say they are so busy, they are so happy with their jobs, this and that, but they turn up like 45 minutes early. You can't be that busy. So, you know, yeah, so we always say that. And we always say, if you've been shopping, because most of our clients are in, you know, office buildings where they have shopping malls downstairs. I say, if you go shopping before you go to the interview, go and put the bags away in your car or leave it with the reception. Just don't take them in. But if you have to tell someone that, then they're already not good for the job, right? I mean, if they can't even think for themselves, then... So, yeah. So, what else about her do you think Judy is not impressed with? Yes? What she's wearing. What she's wearing. What's wrong with what she's wearing? Oh, hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mean to be judgmental, but I think the jewellery choice okay. and the choice of T-shirt, I think it's a uh -huh. bit low. Okay, so yeah. low neckline. Yeah, yeah low neckline. Right. It's not okay. contrasting properly. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so have you ever thought of this? Maybe the reason why Judy didn't like her and didn't like the second candidate is because she already liked the first candidate so much. Yeah. Sometimes you can't compete no matter what because they're already impressed with somebody else. They like somebody else. You have no chance. That's what I thought when I first watched this video because I thought, you know what, the second girl, I mean, honestly, if there wasn't the first girl, the second girl wasn't so bad except for the fact that she's just, you know, she just has no energy. She comes across as she has no energy. But if you didn't have the first choice, you'd be left with the two of them. Who would be your better candidate? Right? Valeria was, in fact, an actress planted by us without Judy's knowledge. I'd actually been told by Terry to um, fidget, mm -hmm. to um, not look her in the eye, to not smile, mm -hmm. and to um, move around in my chair quite a bit and just be evasive in general. Isn't that interesting? So she was told to what? To have no eye contact, yeah, to be evasive, to move around, and what else? Fidget a lot and all that. So that's totally the opposite from what I said. Um, what is a good conversation, right? So a good conversation, you'd be looking at someone, you'd be nodding, you'd be smiling, you'd be, you know, acknowledging them, you'd be probably answering them or asking questions. So she's been told to do the totally opposite in order for her not to come across as professional. Now, let's see this. But look closely at the first five seconds. The three women have already been ranked in order, and the order never alters. Bridget, hello. Well done. You did really well in your interview. You were absolutely excellent, and we're delighted to offer you the job. So oh. many congratulations. Thanks very much. And the very best of luck. That's great, thank you. Bridget's been in her new job for 10 months now and is doing well. I was quite surprised that it um, showed the results so quickly, the first five seconds, though some of them were very obvious. Valeria was within the first five seconds, was going to have to fight very hard to get better. But first impressions are very, very important. So originally they said first impression is formed within the first 15 seconds, but if you watch this, it's what? It's five seconds. And they don't change their minds once they put a stamp on you. So you really only have five seconds. That's very short, isn't it? Yeah. So no matter what you say, it doesn't matter after that, because once they've labelled you, you're dead. Yes, you were going to say something. <laughs> I didn't mean you're dead, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Low neck line, this, that. <laughs> uh, males, females. No, we didn't okay. know. That's, that's the, only, um, yeah. the only experiment Phil Zimbardo's done, okay. 
in order to, um, it's, it's all about first impression. Mm. So he did this, this experiment. Yeah, looking at it, like, uh, it's just my opinion as, a, as, as, an, as an engineer, we look at, yeah. like, you know, you've got to have a spectrum. Yeah, but sure. But like, looking at, you but know, the do's so and don'ts. Though. Yeah. You know that. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That, that, that's very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I teach probably twice a week. Um, I've been doing this nine years. I don't just teach in Thailand, I teach in China and uh, sometimes in Germany. After four, I tell all my students to never call me. I've never been to a school reunion, never. Last time I went to a wedding was 30 years ago. I hardly go out to dinner with my friends because I enjoy being alone. I read, I don't watch TV, I only watch two channels, BBC and CNN. Yeah. So I don't know whether I should call myself an introvert, but I'd rather call myself private, if you know what I mean, because I don't have problems interacting with people. But when my job is done, I want privacy. I think you are right in saying that the job market really favors those who are so out there. But then again, you know, I think there's a place for everyone. You just have to find it. Yeah. You just have to find it. Yes, sorry. What do you have to say about headhunting for those that there is a there's a common many studies that have been done that show that people with non-Western at least in the West non-Western sounding names or Muslim names have are already prejudiced against by hirers. What do you have to say about that? Nothing. <laughs> I have nothing to say about that. Well, it's really unfortunate. It really is, and and I travel a lot, and so I. Oh, it's kind of hard. Yeah, I travel a lot and, you know, I mean, being a Thai, it's not easy to travel. Being a Thai woman, it's not easy to travel. Fortunately, I was born in Germany, so it's stamped in my passport. Even then, when I go to the German embassy to get my visa, I can see how others are being questioned. Do you know what I mean? And I know it's a protocol, but you, that's when you sense that it's just so unfair. And that's, just, that's a small scale, but when you think of the bigger scale, which is what you just mentioned, I mean, what can I say, you know? Yeah. Right, anybody else? Yes. I'm sorry, going back to the points about the three different women, I don't think it's valid to criticize their appearance or exactly. their clothing. Like, mm -hmm. I think this criticism of their clothing is like, one of them is wearing too many dark colours and the other's wearing something too bright and I feel like you can't win. As long as you look professional by the guidelines, I don't think criticising their appearance or even in that case their weight has any relevance to how suitable they no, are I for No, I totally the job. agree. But think about this for a second. The first lady, she came in, her hair was put up. Yeah. Her, she looked... No, think about this. Why did, you, why did we say she looked professional? The way she carried herself, yeah. The second candidate, why did we say she looked like she had no energy? Exactly. The third candidate, why did we not like her or why did Judy not like her? The way she carried herself. So, you know, clothes. I always say this when I, when I teach, and actually I just said this yesterday. I was working with a CEO and I said, you know, I believe we all just like clothes hangers. I have seen some expensive ones, and you can hang anything on them, and, you know, the clothes look really good. And I have seen some cheap ones. And once you hang whatever on them, you know, the clothes look really cheap. So it's up to you what you want to be, really, right? But a lot of it has to do with your posture and how you carry yourself. Okay? Anybody else has anything to say? Yes, you're so far away and your arm's so small. Like, chances are Lucy is just born to be an introvert where they are uneasy to look into people's eyes for a long time. And uh, like, it's an unconscious thing. And are there any ways or method to improve the situation of eye contact for in introverts? Can you wait three minutes? I'm going to get into eye contact in three minutes. Can you wait? Can you hang in there? Yeah? OK. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, well, I've heard that there was a psychological research saying uh, when men smiling, uh, people tend when to... When men smell or when men uh, are smiling? When men are smiling. Okay. Um, 
people tend to think they are not uh, trustworthy, but when, when females are smelling, they tend to think they are polite and trustworthy. So, uh, have you uh, heard of this? Uh, no, I have yeah. not. No. <laughs> well, there Actually, I have, I have read something similar, but it's not about the way uh, a person smiles. It is about the size of a person's eye. Yeah, I've read that, that, you know, they have, they have done some research to say if someone has, you know, big eyes, they look more honest. And smaller eyes, sorry, <laughs> smaller eyes, they're not trustworthy or, you know, less trustworthy than people with big eyes. And I think that is just simply because we always say that, you know, looking at somebody's eyes, you know, eyes are the windows to the soul, whatever. So that's what it's about. Yes. At the... At people that are usually around, um, like Western people, then they interpret body language differently than um, people from other cultures. Like, just like, for example, the other day we were talking about what it's rude to, yeah. to do if you're in foreign cultures, and um, they did this demonstration where they were just pointing at something, yeah. and we were like, what's happening? And then they had to explain afterwards, oh, in our culture, it's really rude to point, even if it's in a positive context. So, like, maybe the small eyes and big eyes would be different depending on what your heritage is. Or the is. smile. Or the smile, yeah, if you like yeah. used to, yeah, different culture. No, no, I totally agree, yeah. Anybody else? Right, okay, I'm going to move on. Oh, thank you. I actually have a little test for you to do, but I'm going to push that back a little bit because I want to talk about, uh, I want to actually show you how, or should I say how, how our interaction skills started. Okay, and that would cover um, eye contact and everything else too because I think it's very important. Right, let me just move this a little bit. Yes. Xavier, Xavier, hello, hello. Only 10 minutes old, Xavier's infant senses are bombarded with new sights, sounds, and feelings. He watches his father pull faces and then slowly responds. This isn't conscious mimicry. Xavier doesn't even know he has a face. But he's managing to translate what he sees into similar actions of his own. I show you, yes, sorry. Um, finding different ways and whatever you see, you're going to use because it's all you know. Mm -hmm, so we mm -hmm, use that mm -hmm. to communicate mm -hmm. whether it, it could be any meaning behind yeah, it. Yeah, because that's pre-verbal, right? Because a baby, you know, is just 10 minutes old, unable to speak and all that. So that's the first way of communication. And it's, it, it's part of survival, right? Because they can't take, a, take care of themselves. They depend on their, ca their caregivers. Okay, I'll show you another video, and this one is all about facial expressions. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? Yeah. 
she makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play. What do you take from this experiment? Anybody? Yes? Probably that you can communicate without words. So you can communicate using just nonverbal communication and even infants or like babies one year old are able to do that still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing, the one most important thing I picked up from this experiment is the fact that we are so quick in recognizing somebody's emotions through their facial expression or lack of facial expression. That's how fast we are. And so that's why face has become the biggest channel of communication. So big that a lot of times we're only good at reading faces and we forget the body. So who's, who's good at reading body language in this room? You are. Ah, really? OK. <laughs> Sorry? I see. Oh, OK, that's interesting. And you, what did you study? Uh-huh, okay. Just two of them? Anybody else? Yes? I feel like I know how to read body language very well because I've worked in recruitment. Um, oh, you worked in recruitment? Yeah, how many so, years? Uh, about a year, not very long. I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Impressive, yes. Uh, I feel like I'm pretty good. I've, I've received some training and I, I talk about mental health to high school students. And um, I, have to, I have to watch them closely in case someone's getting upset, and then I can address that. But yeah, I think I'm all right. Uh huh. OK, yes. I haven't forgotten you. It's <laughs> actually, <up. laughs> uh, actually, I am a play group tutor, and I teach kids. And then uh, I have some trainings on like, how to read uh, children's like, the facial expressions, what, they, what is their needs. Like, they are introverts, so they are not forcing out what they need. But uh -huh. as a teacher, you have to right. observe. Yes. Huh. yes. Definitely experts in like, picking out things like that. But I think we're all kind of experts in ourselves just through our nature. I mean, even that baby was an expert, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think we're all pretty good at it, but obviously there's people that are amazing at it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think we're all pretty good at reading body language, but it's just how far, you know, and how accurate we are. And, um, you know, I think it only comes from a lot of experience, like with, you know, with you, for example, if you work with children, I mean, they're a good source of, you know, body language. Uh, you know, if you want to read someone's body language, starting with them is a good place. But would you say, or would you agree with me, that children's body language and adults' body language are totally different? Yeah. Totally different. Yes. Children come at it the entire world in an unfiltered fashion, whereas exactly. humans, exactly. as adults, very much put in a barrier. And so we, why do we do that? We do choose the way we want to present ourselves. Why? So that we can come across a certain way. Okay. Why do we do that? Why do we want to come across a certain way? Yep. Um, I think like in different situations, for example, if, um, I don't know, say it's like your first time going on a date or something and you're not very experienced and you're try you feel uncomfortable but you're trying to present a different, you know. A different you? A different you, yeah. So you, you try, you overcompensate or you might be uncomfortable. You try to impress? Yeah, or even trying to like um, fit into situations where you haven't got experience or, or like, in crowds, if you're introverted, sometimes you're overthinking your mm -hmm, movements, and mm -hmm. so it doesn't look natural as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Remember, yes, sorry. 
I think it speaks to sort of a transactional sort of context that we all live in. Every kind of communication has a purpose. And so the m more older we get, the more experience we have in different facets of mm -hmm. our life, mm -hmm. we will draw upon the strengths that will best suit us in what we want out of that conversation or mm -hmm. out of that interaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. Remember the video? There was, another, there was a, a psychiatrist called Terry who was analyzing the video, and he was saying, when anybody meets anybody for the first time, we gather as much information as possible in order to make up our minds about what the other person is like. Why do we do that? Why is it so important to gather information about them? What do we want? Are you pointing at him, or are you, are you raising your hand as you went back like that? I thought, I thought you were pointing at him, yes? <laughs> um, I was just going to say, like, from like a historical point of view, collecting information rapidly about a situation was due to safety. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, I guess that's also where stereotypes come into play. If you see someone that's threatening, you're trying to catalog information rapidly to understand, um, like, the position that you're in and how what the relationship between you and the person would be. Mm -hmm. And in a more professional environment, you're trying to um, appeal yeah. to someone or yeah, present there yourself. Is it. Yes. Well, just building on to that, it's essentially you want to see whether that person's a threat or not. You want to see whether that person is what? A threat. A threat? Yeah, a threat. A threat. Oh, yeah, a threat. That's true. Friend or foe? Huh. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody got any questions? Eye contact is coming on. Okay. This mother and this baby are in a, in a, in a process called attunement. His eyes and her eyes are locked together, not locked together, but dancing together, really. And in this child's brain, a thousand connections per second are being formed. And this child is learning to read facial expression. This child is learning about the world. He's learning that the world is responsive or not responsive. He's learning that he can be an object of delight, that he can delight others. He's learning what he's worth. He's learning what the world is like. He's learning so much so quickly that we can't even conceive of it. This interaction is critical for human development. Without it, you, you, you're impaired in so many ways. I can't even begin to speak of them. Some of them you see in your courtroom. And so what happens is impulse. The mother, and the mother, by the way, is being changed as well. Oxytocin is being secreted. She's learning. She's, she's actually in an, in an altered state. And, and you moms and dads know that, right? When you're in, in that state with a kid, especially at that age, and they're, they're gooey and all that stuff, you're, you're, you're in a reciprocal interactive uh, state that is the foundation of empathy. OK, so the impulses come in through the eye. They go to the visual cortex. They come up here to the limbic system. Then they go up here to the frontal cortex. And the, the whole brain, it's not just one place that empathy resides. It resides all over the brain. And it's a, it's a process. Here's another example. This, this child is learning to, not just with his eyes, but also in this case with his hands and also with his ears and with a sense of touch and everything else, smell. He's learning. His brain is forming a concept of what other humans are like, what the world is like. Now, when you see this, a number of women and the, and the most secure men in the room can feel a tug, right? You feel a tug. You want to respond to this baby. If that one doesn't get you, maybe this one will. OK. <laughs> the, the point is this, is that our midbrains are also at, uh, attached. And we're wired this way as well. We don't just learn this entirely to respond. And we want to make it, we want to, we want to play with the little thing. You know, we want to, well, you, 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 all this, the mother is called mother ease. These are my little babies, my, you know, all that high-pitched, sing-songy voice, all of that. That's universal, by the way, and every culture in the world plays those kinds of games with their children at this stage of development because the child needs that in order to learn the phonemes, to form words, in order to, to recognize voices and to understand the patterns of speech and to, and to see the, the, the reciprocity and to, and to see the, the fact that they're active agents. This is the exact opposite of being an orphan or being a kid who's been neglected. Now, what percentage of your caseloads are neglect, in fact, compared to abuse? Abuse gets all the press. What percentage are neglect? 
I would guess 70%, 75%, 80%. Am I too high? No? Yes? OK. Yes, the general, the general rule is around 80% in certain parts of the country. I suppose it depends on how, how impoverished the, the uh, geographic area that you're working with is. Here's another example. Same thing. Critical. This is what you're looking for. Connectedness, not attachment. Different. Here's the reciprocal play. Peekaboo, peekaboo. The kid is learning object constancy, that the world doesn't go away. See, there's no way that a, a child would know a priori that the world hasn't vanished when it leaves its uh, 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 field of vision. But with this game of peekaboo, which is played around the world, the child's brain learns all these things. So what does eye contact do then? You said someone saw connecting, but um, there's some cultures, also in our society back home, where looking someone in the eye is very direct, and it's not as respectful. Is it like it to be? So I think there's different answers to that mm -hmm. question. Okay. Okay. Well, let's hear it from you then. Did you raise your hand just now? One of you? Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, I was going to say the same thing about um, there's a human connection that goes in that experience. Um, but I've, I've also had a question as well. Sure. I find sometimes when I'm talking to someone, I won't look in both their eyes. I'll look at one of them, and then I'll vary. I don't know why. <laughs> But I find it like very full on. How do you do that? Look at, at someone. Okay. I don't know. But does everyone do that? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> you do that too? Okay. Thank Did you. Did you say you do? I like, I not like all the time I do it. Just sometimes uh -huh. I vary when I'm like. So why, why won't you look at them in both eyes? Well, I feel like if I'm talking to someone for a really long time, like. I At the end of the conversation. Eye contact, you mean, yeah. you're giving it a rest. You only look yeah. at... Yeah, <laughs> it's quite intense, like emotionally draining. That's I interesting. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of that before, yeah. but that's interesting. Okay. Right, anybody else? Yeah. Yep. To look someone in the eyes, you're not even really supposed to look at, like, above, like, their lips. Because anything above, like, below, like, below is fine. But if you look in their eyes, it means that you think that you're better than them. <laughs> and that they don't like to, like, you shouldn't really be talking to them. That's just how it was when I grew up and where I was raised. Yes. Oh. Uh, I was just going to say that I find that kind of funny because some people find it when you look below at the mouth region, it's quite uncomfortable, especially I think probably women find it a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> so That's it's, true. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Difference. yeah. Actually, actually, I'll just tell you a funny story. Um, we, had, we, we sent a lady to be interviewed. This was ages ago when I was a headhunter. And this guy wouldn't look her in the eye. He kept looking at her chin. And she came back and she told us that he was looking at her breast. He wasn't. But he said he just didn't want to stare at her. And he was taught not to stare. So that's what happened. So you know, I think it's, it makes more sense to look at someone you know, in the eyes. Yes? Well, I still I, I can't really figure out uh, why do some in some cultures it's not okay to look in the eyes, uh, but I, I'll look into it later, uh -huh. uh, maybe. But uh, uh, still, I I think it's, it's ultimately it's a show of confidence. Because sometimes we have uh, that sort of illusion that it, if I can't see you, you can't see me. I think it's more uh, of connectedness rather than yeah. you know. So yeah, it, when I lack confidence, I may not I, I may want to you know hide. Uh -huh. uh, myself, yeah. Yeah, uh, but yeah. uh, to do so, I, I may hide you from my vision <laughs> uh, in order to hide myself. Mm. So mm. I think there's some sort of uh, illusion that we all uh -huh. hide, uh, will have uh, yeah. unconsciously. Sorry. So I think eye contact make, uh, shows engagement, mm -hmm. and it uh, definitely shows that uh, the other person is listening. Sometimes also when the conversation is too long and you doze off, but the other person still thinks that you're still listening to them because your eyes are still yes. connected. Yes, that is true, <laughs> so, that is true. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes? Um, I think that depends on the context, because I think um, eye contact can also be like a... Uh, like can create a power dynamic as well. Like, if you're walking in the street and you make eye contact with someone and hold it, it's kind of like, who's going to look away first? Like, that power play. And, um, you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, I think um, making eye contact with someone is really important because you express a lot from your face. Sure. So if you're not looking at someone's face, then you miss a lot of the way that they're, tr they're intending to, s to communicate. Mm. 
Okay. Yes. I have a question. Is too much eye contact a bad thing? Like, if I we have a just about to say, really yeah, long conversation. Sometimes I just look around because okay, it's weird. Okay, too much eye contact. What does it mean? Too much eye contact. Staring. Yeah. Who stares? What kind of a person would stare? How would that person? How how would that? Okay, I'll give you an example. Just two weeks ago, an English guy phoned me. He's a PhD graduate in um, computer science. He lives in Thailand now. He's been here four years. He has four companies. He's very successful in doing online games. He phoned me and he said, I want to come to your class. I said, why? He, I said, he said he thinks he has communication problems. I said, tell me about it. He said, he always stares. He's been told many times he stares all the time at people he's talking to, but he doesn't move any other parts of his body, especially his hands, <laughs> sorry, especially his hands. So he came to class, and when he was talking, he would not move his hands. Now I get him to move his hands up to here and lessen his eye contact. But he stared because he stares a lot because that is the only way he exerts power, because he has no power in his body. It's, it's a different story, though. But coming back to what you were saying, <laughs> coming back to what you were saying, I think there are people who stare because of dominance. Do you know what I mean? Because they, yeah, because they want to show dominance. Um, either that, or you know, I, I have met a lot of kids nowadays who are different, and they've never been taught to not stare for too long. And they would just stare throughout, you know, the whole conversation. And, and they don't hardly blink. I've never met anyone. I, mean, I met this boy the other day. He was so funny because he, I don't think he even blinked. And I felt like going like that, you know. Are you, can you blink? Yeah, so I, I think it's, I mean, my take on it would be too little is not good and too much is just not good. So you really have to find that balance. Yeah? Yes. Would you describe that as a symptom or a cause? Because sort of like our brains, the emotional part of our brains, don't have capacity for language. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of like suggesting that what if people can feel your authenticity and your confidence, and so then your body language is sort of more a symptom of that, if you know what I mean? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. Um, I'm, I'm saying that, um, oh, for sort of example, with eye contact. Yeah. Um, if I said that I had a conversation with someone that I really liked, I would love for them to look me deep in yeah, the eyes for very long yes, yes. because I like that person. So my emotional part of my brain is appreciative of that. If I met someone I felt uncomfortable with, I wouldn't like them looking at me. So that's why I'm suggesting that perhaps body language is just a symptom of our emotions. And yes, yes. Now yeah. I know what you mean. Okay, yeah. can I just, can I just, can you picture this? If someone is staring... Yeah, someone, li someone who likes to stare, let's put it this way. Someone who likes to stare, what do you think his posture would be like? Hands down. Oh, hands down, okay. If someone is always staring, well, imagine whoever you were talking to and he was always staring at you, what was his posture like? People put their chin down, so it's like also like, especially if they're taller than you, so it's almost like they're looking down at uh -huh. you. Even even staring. if they're taller than you, sometimes they kind of like do this like looking down, like head down, looking up sort of thing. I don't know. It's kind of, okay. kind of strange. So, so back to what you were saying, I was going to say, the reason why I asked that question was I was going to say, so if you have a conversation, you're having a conversation with someone and someone looks you in the eyes, what does that tell you? Number one, you're having a good conversation. Number two, you're on par. Number three, the person is confident. Would you say that? So if someone is not looking at you, what would you say? How would you describe the person? What do you, why do you think the person is not looking at you? Yes. Probably similar to what we said before, quite small and that rounded idea, the kind of like pulling away. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, somebody was going to ask me a question. Somebody raised their hand over that. Oh, yes. Just on that, it, they'd be sort of caged in, like trying to protect themselves, like if it's nerves at least. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm going. I have one more slide. Can I? May I have one more? Uh, I, I'm going to show you one more slide about posture. But before I do that, can you all stand up, please? Okay. So, so two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Four, five, six. What happened to the rest of you? 
Hmm? So what, what happened? Yes. I'm both an introvert, an introvert and an extrovert. So some, sometimes I crunch my back and sometimes I straighten it back. So it depends on the situation and whether I'm comfortable, I'm comfortable with the subject that I'm talking about or, okay. the, or the area. Okay, we all do that. Postural changes or posture alterations, we all do it because we have to. To get comfortable, I'm sure, you know, I've been talking for what, an hour and something. You must have moved 20 times to get comfortable, yeah? To get comfortable. And when you're asking questions, you'll be in a different posture. But your posture in general, what do you think your posture says about you? So show me a confident posture. <laughs> Not with the words, do it. <laughs> show me confidence. So what would your stance be like? Would you be like this if you're confident? No. no. So what this, like this means you're wobbly. Yeah, so you would, your stance would be like this, wouldn't it? Right. So show me confidence. What would you do with your shoulders if you're confident? Yeah, right. So what if you're overconfident? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what if you're sad and miserable? Yeah, you would shrink, right? Uh-huh. So your posture says so much about you. And let's say if you're standing like this, listening to me, can you tell me you're going to have a good time tomorrow evening? You can't, can you? So your posture. <laughs> what did you just do? <laughs> so your posture says a lot about you, and your posture actually forms how you feel. Did you know that? I'm sure you know this. When we were crawling, we protected ourselves with our heads and our back. You knew that, right? And then when we started to sit up and stand up, what's, what's every toddler's number one goal? To be able to stand up and walk and walk upright. Walk upright. So what does uprightness has to do with? How do you, what do you associate uprightness with? Yes. Uh, coming from like a biological level, it's about being able to see and being able to survey danger. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Um, like talking about the importance of eye contact. Like if you look at wolves or dogs, like their eyes are in the same level when they're on the ground. But if you're a child, then you're not actually at the same level as your parents because uh -huh. you're uh -huh. facing you're a different looked, direction. Looking down at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else? So what do you associate uprightness with? Yes. Like standing up tall and keeping your head high. Uh-huh. Yes? I would say stability. Mm-hmm. So they've got their balance. Yeah. Well and balance, stability, leadership, pride. What else? Wow, we have so many cameras. <laughs> <laughs> pride, what else? Yes? Um, it kind of shows that you're switched on and you're prepared to go and do uh -huh. something as well. Uh-huh. Okay, so just now I was talking about when we were crawling. We protected ourselves with our heads and our back. When we're standing up, we're, we're opening up. Uprightness is so important. You cannot empower anyone if you're not upright. Because what does it mean? It means you can't even deal with your own issues. Right? How can, you, how can you tell anyone to do anything if you can't even show them leadership, if you can't even show them power, if you can't even be upright yourselves? It is so important, because imagine the opposite of being upright is what? Sunken, caved in, right? Sunken, caved in, down, depressed, insecure, what else? Everything that is totally the opposite, which is not winning. So think about this. Do you know we're, we're born to stand up, stand up straight, and learn by opening up our bodies. Our shoulders are the gatekeepers of our hearts. That's why we pull them together when we're sad, when we're depressed, or when we're trying to protect ourselves. We've come a long way from crawling, so no more protecting our, our, ourselves with heads down, right? You need to embrace life. You really need to open up and be upright. Thank you.